So as we get started, let me just open us in a word of prayer. Can I do that? Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day. Uh, we thank you so much that we're uh, in a church that cares about mental health, that, uh, that we get to uh, share together, minister together with something that uh, is common to the human condition. Uh, all of us have mental health, and, uh, and Lord, it's just a blessing that we can commune here today. And, and we're going to talk about a really important topic, Father. Um, and, uh, and I just pray that you would help us today, that we would have a great discussion together. I pray that, um, that uh, you would just guide and direct our time and connect us with one another. In your name we pray. Amen. All righty. So we've got uh, you around tables for a reason. Uh, we've got a discussion question on the table for you. Uh, what do you hope to get out of our mental health community today? So why don't you spend a little time talking around your tables, and then we'll pull you in a little bit. Go for it. All right. Might want to finish the sentence. I hate to interrupt you midstream. I'm Kay Warren. For those of you that um, are new, I went up and hugged somebody when I first got here, and <laughs> she was just a little, and, and the person sitting next to her said, she doesn't know who you are, and it was like, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, who is this strange woman who's, you know, giving me hugs? So I'm Kay Warren, uh, in case this is your first time, uh, my husband and I pastored here for 43 years and retired a, a year ago, but yes, thank you. So... So if I approach you and give you a hug, I really am not just totally random. I, you know, have a little, I, I really am credible, okay? I'm, I, I'm, I'm trustworthy. But anyway, um, so glad that you're here today. Really, uh, it is always a privilege. I look forward to the fourth Sunday of every month. I look forward to this time. I look forward to the conversations. Lots of hugs. Uh, lots of great information from the mental health professionals that come and speak, the other people with lived experience, um, and just to be with other people who walk on the road of mental health or mental health struggles with either you or your family member. It's just, it's not an us and a them, it's a we, you know, so I hope that when you're here every time you never feel like, you know, you're being talked at or, you know, you're in a, no, no, it's, it's a we, it's us. We are, we are all here together um, to share our lives and our stories. And what I want to talk to you just a little bit about today, and before I do that, there are some cards on your table. So as you're listening to our presenters and you might have some questions, feel free to write the questions. We'll try to answer them or address them in our Q&A time later on. We'll collect these later, but just be listening and then you can write any questions. But I have lived with a low level of depression. As far back as I remember, I literally don't remember a time in my life where depression wasn't part of my story. Long history on my dad's side, going back at least 100 years from what we can check in letters and family stories and family legends, very strong um, depression strand that goes through on my dad's um, side. So when my dad would experience it, when my younger brother experienced it, when my cousins experienced it, when I experienced it, um, it wasn't completely a surprise. But I have to tell you the ferocious way it landed on my seven-year-old little boy, Matthew, really took me to my knees. I was not prepared for my, my little boy to experience such serious depression. And, and for the next 20 years, he and I fought the major depression that, that was really a predominant part of his everyday life. And we had hundreds of conversations. I mean hundreds, if not thousands, of conversations through those years, and many of them were centered around these kinds of thoughts. Because he was a person of faith. He had given his life to Jesus as a young child, as much as he knew how as a little boy. But so as a person of faith, and he would say, why has this happened to me? And where is God? And how can this be okay? And how do you keep going when the weight of really dark thoughts and feelings and emotions um, are just like, I don't know why the voice of despair is usually so much louder than the voice of hope, but often it is. And some of you could probably tell the same kind of story, that, those, that the, the sound or the voice of, of despair sometimes can just scream at you. And the voice of hope can just feel like a tiny little faint whisper that you try to catch as it, as it runs by. And 
We just talked about, you know, what does a person of faith do when the journey is long and hope can be hard to hold on to? And we talked about pray, and we prayed as a family, and we would talk about, does prayer really work? I mean, does prayer really help in certain situations? Does it, because sometimes it just genuinely feels like that God is not listening and that he is not empathetic to people in suffering and that he is um, ignoring the suffering and we cry out and, and yet when you're a person of faith, sometimes you don't know what to do with those questions and I will just tell you, if you have had those questions and you've been in those conversations, those are good, honest, true, and real questions. And that's what I wanna talk about just real briefly before I introduce um, our speakers today. People have asked me for years, what part of the Bible do I most relate to? People are always curious about that with like if pastors and their families, you know, have, I don't know, these special things from God and, you know, you, these passages are illuminated to you. And I would just tell you that is not true. <laughs> it's not true. We are trying to figure our way out like everybody else. But the part of the Bible that has always meant the most to me, and I imagine always will, is the Psalms. Um, and, you know, some of the Psalms, they are happy. They are like really happy. They're the kind of things you would imagine you're supposed to read at, at church on a weekend because they're all about how God's amazing and, and God's in the heavens and, you know, and joy, 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 and it's all this stuff, and you feel like that's exactly what should be read, you know, at church on, on a weekend. But here's the thing that is, I think, really significant. Not that there are psalms that are happy and joyful. That, great. But when I'm feeling low, just cruise in the bottom of the shelf, that doesn't necessarily always help me. What I love about the psalm and the psalmist is that in the psalms, there are particular ones where the writers boldly call God to account and accuse him of turning his back on them, abandoning them after making strong promises. And they basically say to God, this terrible thing happened on your watch what are you going to do about it? And ones like Psalm 13, where the psalmist starts out by saying, how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me? Walter Brueggemann calls these painfully real and almost aggressive psalms, psalms of disorientation, because they were written by individuals who have known God in the good times, they are written by people who have known God when all was right in the world, when there was peace, when there was harmony, when there were beautiful, joyous occasions. There were times of orientation, when everything is right in the world and there's safety and plenty and there's no lack and there's no want and there's pleasure, but, but they now find themselves with their lives upended, turned upside down, leaving them disoriented and dysregulated. And, and sometimes in those psalms, the words just tumble out of the writer's mouth and they're full of anger and confusion and doubt. And as I said, accusation um, uh, toward God and they're just full of the chaos that's surrounding them. And as Christians, as people of faith, um, who like the happy psalms to be read in church, it's, it, it's tempting to skip over those psalms, to skip over those psalms of disorientation. It's really tempting to just skip over them because I don't know about you, but sometimes they just make me uncomfortable and I feel like a, a, a grumpy two-year-old who's stamping her foot and saying things like, it's not fair, God, where are you? You know, why did you abandon us? Why don't you keep your promises? I've been good, and yet all this bad stuff has happened to me, and when will you show up and kill off my enemies and restore us? Those are the things the psalmists say. They don't just talk about how amazing life is. They talk about these other kinds of emotions. And they're, I, I think what has been a new insight for me is to realize that this is not like King David, he wrote a lot of them, and Asaph was another psalmist, that those were not their private journals that were discovered hundreds of years later and have now put them in the Bible as though that this was part of a biography, that, that these were their private thoughts that they never knew anybody else would read. When you read those psalms, you'll see little headings, and it says, written by King David for the occasion of, and there's some occasion, or it's, he says, this 
This one is to be sung to the tune of, and he lists it. These were psalms of disorientation that were meant to be shared collectively. They were meant to be shared in the worship time. They were not secret private thoughts that David and Asaph had to keep to themselves. These were, these were words of despair, of anxiety, of fear, of anger, of confusion that they brought to church. They brought those to church and they shared them together. They were always corporate expressions. They were not somebody's private prayer journal. What that means, and to me this, may be, this is probably the most helpful thing I feel like I could say to you as we start, is this. It means we don't have to hide our disorientation from God. God, the things that we feel, the things that we're experiencing, are not just for our own private prayer journals. They can be expressed together. And when it is expressed together, it increases a sense of we belong to each other. You feel that? I feel that. That's how you're expressing your relationship right now to God? That's what I'm feeling in my relationship right now to God. And then you stop feeling like you're a weirdo or a freak or a terrible Christian or somebody whose faith is gone. No, you are a human being who, like the psalmist, is a complete and whole person. And we bring not just our joy and our pleasure and our excitement and our happiness and the good times and the times of orientation. We also get to bring that's times of disorientation and confusion. And here's the key, you guys. They always brought it to God. So together, we're supposed to bring it all to God. The good, the bad, the ugly, the stuff that is a little embarrassing to say out loud, the stuff that we would really like to maybe hide our heads in shame to even acknowledge that we ever feel this or feel that or wonder this. But they brought it to God they laid it out in front of him, and they expected him to do something about it. I think that that is such a beautiful picture of faith, that the Israelites, King David, Asaph, those um, other psalmists, expressed all of their feelings, all of their disorientation, all of their questions, all of their joy, all their ups, all their downs, brought it to God and said, please, you do something about it. And nine times out of ten, every one of those kinds of psalms of disorientation end with, yet I will trust you. Whew. So it's more than okay and more than appropriate to speak the contents of your heart. It's required. It's welcomed. God welcomes. He's always asked to be loved with all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength and all of our weakness, all of who we are. So he asks us to bring it to him boldly and passionately. And so I encourage you to pray the Psalms in their entirety, all of them. Pray them all in your disorientation. And in those times of disorientation, we remind God of what he's done in the past, where he's been faithful, where we've seen him work. We remind him of that. And then we say, God, here's where I am today. And I believe in you for deliverance to come. And we say, keep your word, Lord. Keep your word. And we end all of, our, all of our prayers of disorientation with an affirmation of his unfailing love, holding on to the one and only God, our only hope. And with that in mind, let me read you the few verses that make up Psalm 13. Oh, Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O Lord my God. Restore the light to my eyes, or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat, saying, we've defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall but I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he has been so good to me. Lord, you hear us today. You hear us with these raw, aching, 
hearts and souls, bodies and minds that cry out to you. If we're not there in this moment, we've been there before, and we might be there again of that place of saying, oh, Lord, how long? How long? And to know that others before us had those same experiences, those same heart cries. And we don't need to be ashamed. We don't need to be embarrassed. We don't need to feel like we are less than. We don't need to feel that we aren't really worth coming into your presence with those kinds of words or those kinds of feelings. Thank you for David and Asaph and other psalmists who put on paper for us, not their private prayer journals, but the very fact that we can bring these words together to you as one voice. And God, we say how long we ask that you restore us. And we say, God, I will trust you. You have been so good to me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. My friends, it is really a pleasure to introduce to you. Um, Got to find my paper. It's here. It's not here. I left it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Todd. Yeah, I want to introduce to you um, Benji Fukanen, who currently serves as the outreach chair for the Orange County chapter of the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. He works full time as the outreach manager for the Gooden Center, a nonprofit mental health and addiction treatment center in Pasadena. His personal journey with recovery and faith, as well as being a suicide survivor, has blessed him with a message of hope and a message he shares with the people who need it most. Tay Sisawath currently serves as a board member um, and event chair for, a for the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, Out of the Darkness Walk events, and she works as the program director for a community health care organization and mental health first aid responder for crisis management. She has an MBA in healthcare management and is a certified mental health first aid and community health worker. Her personal journey and struggle with mental health, including overcoming life's challenges and finding meaning in the loss of her sister to suicide, has given her the opportunity to share the message of suicide prevention and mental health in hopes to break the stigma and provide the tools and resources for those in need. So please give a very warm welcome to Benji and Tay. Uh, hello everybody, my name is Benji, and today we're going to have a presentation about suicide prevention. And before we get started, I feel it's important to tell my story because I want to give you the insight of what it feels like or what, it's, what someone that's going through suicidal thoughts. What, what, what is happening with this person? What's going on through their mind? I want to give you a little bit of a taste of what that's like, and then you'll be, under, be able to understand this presentation, and you'll be able to like, learn about the risk factors and the warning signs, and be able to help someone in crisis. So for me, what Case talked about, it started when I was a kid. It started the very first day I was able to play outside, because I went outside, and I discovered that I was different. I was different because my family immigrated here from the Philippines, and I was a person of color in a town that didn't have anyone else that looked like me. So right when I stepped outside, I felt different. I already felt uncomfortable in my own skin. So what was this language I was speaking at my house? What was this food I was eating at my house? Why was everyone so different? You know, I sought approval from them, you know, from the neighbors and the kids. And that's all I wanted. I wanted to be accepted. I wanted them to love me, but they didn't. I was bullied, you know, I was made fun of. And then when I would go to my parents to get the love, to get that acceptance, you know, emotions and feelings, that's not what my parents grew up with in the Philippines. It was a strict culture. And so, you know, it was basically just get over it and, you know, that was their attitude towards it. You know, they had no emotion, they had no empathy towards my situation. So, and my brothers also, you know, they weren't struggling like I was struggling. This, this was my struggle. And, 
you know, it carried on. It carried on through junior high and high school. This is this kid that was just lost and wanted approval. It's on? Good. There we go. Okay. And so what did happen, though, in high school is I was introduced to alcohol. And what did that do? All that fear, all that insecurity, gone. I was normal. I was just like everyone else. So all that depression, all those emotions, buried. They're gone. I became, alcohol was my superpower. And fast forward years and years and years of use, that became my identity. That became who I was. Because I did not want to be that little boy that was fearful and scared of the world. I just wanted to be normal like everyone else. And, you know, I'm taking a lifelong journey, and I'm fast-forwarding it just because so we can get to this presentation. But long story short, 30 years, actually, I'm aging myself, 42 years after the fact, um, I finally got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And sick and tired of the shame, sick and tired of the lies, and I was just done. It was a convergence of, you know, depression, stressors in life, environment. It all convert converged into just one explosion, and that was it for me. I, I was done. I decided to end my life that day, and um, in all accounts, I was successful. I was... Uh, I was, uh, I was flatlined for a little bit, and I did die. And uh, the truth of the matter was, it just wasn't my time. And I, you know, woke up in the emergency room, and that began my long journey um, into recovery and trying to figure out what happened. And it was crazy because I woke up and, you know, I started to go through this process of recovery and now I had to feel emotions again, which I've buried for so many years. And now I had to deal with these emotions uh, and tackle them head on and I wasn't strong enough. And I ended up going to treatment and I went to treatment and my therapist recognized my pain. And you know what she did? She gave me a book and the book was called A Purpose Driven Life. <laughs> and she wasn't, yeah, thank you. She, she's a clinician, a licensed marriage and family therapist. To bring God into the rooms, that just wasn't, that wasn't what she was supposed to do, but she felt the calling. She saw my pain, and she brought the book, and I went through that book fast. And fast forward, uh, a couple of months, I was baptized right here in, in this pool, and I found God for the first time in my life. That, that empty hole that I, would, that I had my whole life, that emptiness, that acceptance, I was missing God. I was missing God. I was missing that love. And once it filled me, you know, I was, I was truly reborn, redeemed, and renewed here at Saddleback Church. And I, I used to look back and want to, you know, take a time machine, take a left here, take a right here, say yes there, say no here. But every step, every step I took, it needed to happen for me to be right here, right now, to give people that are suffering hope that there is light at the, under the, at, at the end of the tunnel, that you know, hold on to hope, hold on to faith, and your life can change. You don't have to be in the darkness. And just a little bit more about how God really works. That therapist, I did not find out till two years after the fact, she confessed to me that she went to Saddleback Church and she had a near fatal parachute accident and, um, and she should have been dead, but the church prayed for her. She made a miraculous recovery and this was God saying to her, I saved you, now you need to save Benji. 
And that is a true story that I did not learn until two years after that uh, we, I went through my recovery. So I'm going to talk about our presentation. When I went through my struggles before I attempted, I was showing warning signs. I was, all these warning signs, I was exhibiting. I was giving away my, I was giving away my, uh, my loved items. I was, you know, I was isolating. I was showing all the signs, but you know what? No one could recognize it because no one was educated in suicide prevention. And that's what we're gonna do for you here today. We're gonna educate you, we're gonna teach you the risk factors and the warning signs and how to be able to talk to someone that's in crisis. So now I'd like to introduce to you Tay. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having us here and uh, making mental health a, a priority conversation in our community. So again, I'm Tay. I am a board member with American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, OC chapter. I'm also the walk chair for this year's Out of the Darkness Walk, October 14th, uh, Centennial Park, Santa Ana. Um, it is a walk, it is our largest um, walk and it's nationwide. You'll, your uh, people are gonna be walking with thousands of others who's been touched or affected by suicide loss. Okay, so a few things about suicide, and I want to make, we want to make sure that um, everyone understands that suicide is a health issue. It is a very complex health issue. And through the presentation, you're going to see clearly why that is. And we also know that it is preventable. So let's get started. Um, so look, we're gonna go through the scope of the problem. And then we're gonna go through you know, the research that we have. Because American Foundation of Suicide Prevention is the largest private funder for suicide prevention research. And that is a big part of uh, suicide and preventing suicide loss. And then we're gonna talk about prevention and what you can do, the risk, the warning signs, and so forth. So we know that suicide um, ideation like any other health issues, do have warning signs. It may be very subtle, but it may be very drastic. But just like someone who has cardiac arrest, there are warning signs. Now, how we talk about suicide matters. So you'll hear in the media, social media, um, and organizations and people that we have not gotten to yet, you'll hear them say they committed suicide or you know, um, it was a successful attempt. The reason why we don't, want to, uh, we don't want to use committed is because it has a negative connotation to it. It's like you're committing a crime, you're committing a sin. And it also implies that the person doing the act is of sound mind, have some kind of control when there's a loss. So what we want to use is die by suicide end at their life, kill themselves, or death by suicide. And also we want to have a first person, um, a person living with um, suicide ideation, or a person uh, with you know, depression. And so we don't stigmatize them, and we want to normalize what uh, they have or what they're um, going through. OK, next slide, please. Let's talk about the scope. Suicide affects every socioeconomic background. And there are, there are research now that age groups are now being affected. And with what we know is that the majority of suicide that occurs happens three to six months after improvement. So in that, it's like, wait a minute, three to six months after improvement. So it's ongoing. Just because they tried once doesn't mean they're not going to ever try again. So it's ongoing. And now we know, um, can you, next slide, please. Worldwide. We're guesstimating. I'm saying guesstimating because it's a very, um, it's a conservative number because all of the world 
in different cultures in different countries, they don't always report deaths as suicide. And sometimes it's suicide by, like death by suicide isn't always so clear cut. Um, they can, you know, uh, put in, you know, in risky situations where they go, but that does not mean it's not done, you know, under the suicide uh, parameter. But over 800,000 people worldwide. Next, next slide, please. That is one out of 40 seconds. That's worldwide. So let's talk about what we do know in the United States. In the US, it's the 10th leading cause. That's in 2019. That is the uh, most recent um, full data we have. And that's 47,511 people who died by suicide. Well, for every one suicide, 25 attempts. So if you do the math, one and then 25, that's about a million people a year attempting. And so, and how, what does that mean to us? Suicide impacts everyone. It impacts our family, it impacts our friends, our community. And it impacts a little bit different because it was a decision they made. It was something that, it was out of impulse and it could have been prevented. It wasn't like a tragic accident. It was, it was crisis mode. And how do we know about this crisis mode? How come we, how come they didn't talk to us? And there's so much guilt and impact towards it because you're left with more questions than answers. So with that being said, let's look at our age group. Although for the last two years we've done some progress, we've made some progress, however, it's still a very substantial public health issue. In this day and age, we have research. We're more open with mental health conditions. We're more open with, you know, ending the stigma. But yet, our largest age group of 10 to 24 year olds is the second leading causing death in the United States. Still, 10 to 24 years old. My sister was 24. She was a success figure in every sense of the word. She had the beautiful apartment um, overlooking the Boston Bay. We're from Boston. We parked the car in the harbor yard. <laughs> so she was this pinnacle. She worked for a startup called Twitch, which is now popular. And then on August 4th, 2020, she left us. No sign, no letter, no goodbye. Nothing. We did know the signs. We did know why. Um, try to peel it back and say, okay, well, did she show something? But even if there were signs, did we even pay attention? Do we even know what we're looking for? Probably don't. So, ages, five to 12 year olds is a fifth leading cause of death. If you can imagine a five to six year old planning, thinking out, contemplating suicide in the United States, I would have to say it is a community problem, right? It's something that our family have to look at and say, there is something that we need to do. And there is also um, a race disparity as well. Interestingly, this is from per the CDC, and this was issued in 2023. This is the um, from, from the Pediatrics Journal of America, American Medical Association. Um, it shows that five to 12 year olds are um, the age disparity were African American children, boys from five to eight. However, it turns a flip switch after 13. The largest, eight, the largest race committing our uh, die, death by suicide from the age of 13 are their counterparts, um, Caucasian counterparts. Um, these statistics, the data that's behind it, they, they're still very limited um, data as to why, as the correlation, but we do assume that we will have more research on it. Now, 
the largest, fa the fastest growing one that exceeds traffic accidents are the ages from 10 to 14. Those are the prime years. Those are the years that are most impressionable. Those are the years that, you know, they're, they're starting to figure out who they are. 10 to 14, fastest growing in the country. So if that doesn't put something, a thought in our mind saying, we've got to save our youth, there's something there. So let's go into the research. As you know, American Foundation, we are the largest um, private funder for suicide prevention research. And the biggest part of it is finding the, 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 the future goals. So the questions we were asking were, why do people take their own lives? You know, why do these kids think about it? How? Like my sister, like, is there a, did she break up with a boyfriend? You know, or did she do something? I mean, what would make them go to that point of crisis mode where there is no turning back? The thing about suicide is that once, there's a, once that act happens, there's no going back. They can't be resuscitated. It's done. But... It is 100% preventable. So why in this day and age do we still have a second leading cause of death in our youth? So why do, these, why do they take their, their lives? So we all know it's not just one thing. It's a conglomerate of issues. It's one stressor. And I remember, it's, I remember she used to tell me um, when she was really stressed out about getting her master's, she was like, it's always one more thing. And I used to wonder, like, what does she mean by one more thing? But it was a one more issue that she had to deal with. It was mo one more stressor. It was one more thing. So it was just a layered on. And sometimes it's be it becomes so, so hard that it's like you're driving through a tunnel and all of these bricks are falling down on you and the weight of it. And soon the light that you see through that tunnel becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because all of the weight of the rocks, of the, the bridge, is crumbling down. And then you can't breathe. And then that feeling of despair that maybe it's better that they just go and just life would be better without them in it. Or the pain is so, so strong that the only way they see is out and it's hopelessness. Next. So the most of death by suicide, or su who died by suicide do have mental conditions. They do, They're, it's a contributing factor. The thing about um, mental conditions is that sometimes they're not recognized, they're not diagnosed. Um, they go undiagnosed or they didn't get ad adequate help for whatever reason, and it could be, you know, cultural, it could be, you know, a stigma, it could be just a personal choice, or even access to healthcare. We all know how great healthcare is right now. Um, there are physical differences. The, now, the, the, the brain works of someone who, is, who are suicidal and who do have um, suicidal ideology, they do differ in their brain function. It's that their fight and flight response of the prefrontal cortex, it's how they respond to stressors is different from how someone else would. And also um, their impulse control. We find that they're, the part of their brain that has impulse control, it, it's, it works differently. So they lack that impulse control. And the majority of them who do want to um, who dies by suicide, they, they're ambivalent. And most, they, part of them want to live, the other part want to want to die. And what we as um, loved ones, community, mentors, teachers, brothers, sisters, is that we want to give them or remind them of all the reasons to live. And that would distance the reasons that they want to die. So if we can make a little bit of that remembrance, a little bit of time, and then a little bit of space, 
a little bit of a sweet reminder, encouragement, that actually decreases the, the want, the feeling, that feeling of impulse, like I'm gonna do it now, it subsides. Because research does show that the ideation, suicide ideation is very fleeting. It's temporary. It's either 30 seconds, even up to a couple hours. But it's fleeting because of time, space, and of course, um, reducing the method, their access to method of what they want, like how they're gonna do it. Now, when we talk about, okay, for us to want to help someone, um, what do they see in their perspective? Benji has shown his perspective and it's spot on. He is a case study because it's the fear, the ho hopelessness. And crisis mode, when we understand their perspective, it'll help us in understanding what to do next. Because like many, um, those who understand like working with someone who's in crisis mode, you yourself have to show that you're, you're calm, but it's like you're a duck in water, like you're calm and you're trying to level with them, you're calming them down, but then like the duck feet is like swimming in the like below the water, no one knows. That's pretty much what it is. Um, but it helps us understand their perspective. And when they are at that crisis mode, they will not think clearly. There is no clear thought. Now, just imagine if you can go back in time, you can think of the most physical hurt time you've ever had, like you broke a leg or, you know, wisdom tooth taken out. If someone asked you for your you know, like directions to your house, would you be able to give it in a clear, concise manner? Probably not. That's the same thing as a person in crisis. They will not think clearly. They will only have that zeroed in, this is what I'm gonna do, there's no way out, and that's where you gotta, quote unquote, talk them off the ledge, you know, maybe uh, phys phys figuratively or literally. So now, now that we know, like if we understand the perspective and we hear from, you know, survivors, then who's at risk? Because we're talking about like age groups, we're talking about, you know, we've touched on um, groups, age groups, um, world. Well, we can look at the risk factors. There are risk factors, just as we know that there are protective factors, and we'll go into that once, we're going, um, once we go further along in the presentation. But the risk factors, there's health, historical, which is family, background, genetics, and then environmental. So all of these, they're not to say, um, they, there are the risk factors and combination of other factors do increase the chances of a person of whether or not they're gonna be suicidal or if they're gonna take their life. And so let's go into the health factors. Mental health conditions, we all know. One out of four adults will be dealing with mental health conditions. And as of 2023, per the National Council of uh, Mental Wellbeing, I believe it's one out of five now that are diagnosed with, e with one of the five most uh, common uh, mental health challenges, which are depression, bipolar, anxiety disorder, eating disorder. And then the, then the next of kin is personality disorder, psychosis, PTSD, and substance abuse. So those are pretty much the common uh, denominators when it comes to um, health factors as screening. So the thing about substance abuse is that it doesn't necessarily mean the person's gonna be suicidal immediately. It's that they do this prolong, you know, death. It's like they put themselves and they do things to themselves either to um, numb the pain but eventually they'll get there. And so it's like a prolonged uh, suicidal ideation. So depression and anxiety disorders are the most common that are, that are uh, associated to suicide deaths, but not to say that those are, like all of them are. However, just because someone is diagnosed with any of these 
mental health challenges does not mean that they are gonna automatically die by suicide. They, they might not. So that's why we know it's just not just that one, that one thing. Okay, next one. And then we have other health factors. Serious chronic health conditions, chronic pain, and serious head injury. When it comes to pain, um, someone who has endured like cancer treatment, or, and I see this a lot in more elderly um, population, where they're in serious chronic pain that it's like, let me go, I just wanna go. And so um, I see more of that, that's more common in there. Serious head injuries for you parents that have children who are athletes, like baseball, football, um, major brain injury um, has been associated to, um, to, uh, to abnorm abnormal suicide thoughts. Historical facts, family history of suicide, mental health conditions, um, child abuse, or we call ACEs, adverse um, child um, experience, previous suicide attempts, and loss. With the loss part, I see this a lot when someone loses their loved one by suicide. It is very common to feel like you wanna go with them. That they're, the world doesn't matter anymore because the person they love is no longer here. So that is what loss really is about. Um, previous suicide attempts, just because they failed one do, does not mean they're not gonna keep going. It's just a method. It's just the ideation when it pops up. And if you have a history of it, and of course, family history of mental conditions, those are the key factors or red flags. And we always, always encourage that if you have to go on medication and so forth, like you take, me you take aspirin for your headache, we encourage to seek you know, uh, professional help and medication, so be it. Okay, next slide. Environmental. It's, it's environmental, like it's very like extreme um, ra in ranges because we, everyone takes stress differently. Some people can take high stress, some people can't take much stress. Um, well, it's mainly like the excess of lethal means. So if you know that the person has the ideation of how they're going to do it, when you limit their access to it, it reduces the chances of them actually going into that, doing the deed. The thing about suicide ideation is that when someone who is suicidal, who, want, who already has a means of how they're gonna do it in their mind, chances are if you take that away, they don't have any other means. They're not gonna do it with any other like, way to go. Okay, so they're fixated on that way to do it. So if you decrease that, you eliminate that, like you put the firearms away, you lock up the pills, um, you, know, you don't leave them alone so they're not gonna turn into another way to do it. Um, exposure contagion. Exposure and contagion is like a lot for these kids. This is more of the younger generation where it's, a, if you've ever heard of social contagion, where they idolize it. It's like, oh my gosh, it's you know, so romantic. They're romanticizing it. And so when you see a, like a, one kid do it or one group do it, and it's like, oh, it's an it's a effect. So that's the social contagion. Um, stress, everybody deals with stress and stressful life event, like a divorce, losing a job. Um, I spoke to um, a gal who, main breadwinner, three kids, the whole nine, she lost everything. She was laid off um, out of 1,200 people in Orange County. And to her, she tied whatever she had you know, for her family to this job because that was her career, like that's what she knew for 30 years. And because it was done, she, she just felt, she started to be depressed and then the ideation came in and that's when I counseled her. It starts slow, but after two weeks, if there's no improvement, you know that there's an issue. Okay, next, pro next slide. Okay, what we do see is someone really sad, but the back end is the genetic risk depression, stress at work, and drinking more than usual. For someone like a Benji, he's already up there because that is his you know, Superman drink, right? 
but with someone who doesn't normally drink and then they're drinking a pint and a half a day, you know, in a course of like where they're not supposed to, that's when it's a problem. So it's really to gauge what you know about this person. Um, because I know people who could, uh, I know a young lady who can drink the whole football team under the table um, and still be okay. And that's her way of, you know, that she can drink. Um, and then I know someone else who doesn't normally drink and when she does drink, there's something going on. Okay, so when they're out of their, um, their character, that's when you kind of can, red flag should be going up. And that's in the next slide, please. Why do we do research? Obviously, because we need to find ways to find markers. Like, can we predict from what we know now? Um, can we uh, genetically change something about um, uh, the ideations? Can we, are there ways to, um, to prevent this? There's psychotherapy, which is talk therapy. I call a brain coach. Psychotherapy, I think everybody should have a brain coach because we exercise our bodies, we exercise our emotions, we read and write in journals, but then the one big player in this that makes it all go is our brain, and so they need coaching too. Um, therapy has been proven, therapy and medication has been proven um, to be very successful in helping someone um, go through a mental health um, crisis. And then there's, of course, interventions. Interventions to me, it's, it's just being able to talk and open that simple conversation um, and just being able to um, have the courage to ask that question. Are you gonna, do you have thoughts of killing yourself? It is so hard to ask because you don't know if, you can, if you're gonna offend someone or if it's like they become closed off, but that is ultimately what you will have to ask eventually for someone who really needs the help. And so we're gonna talk about prevention. We've got risk factors. We know that if we know the risk factors, we know the protective factors. Mental health care, family and community support, problem solving skills, and cultural and religious belief. Research has found that if someone feels connected and someone feels there, there is a higher purpose, a higher power, that they have more reasons to live than to go. And if we equip them with problem solving skills like cognitive behavioral therapy or journaling or like analyzing or logically breaking down their, their pain points, community and family support is one of the key ones for our adolescents because as part of the age group that are the highest um, uh, death rates is because, is because they do not have their family or community support for either their lifestyle or their um, identity. That is still a problem and that is one of the largest um, group that has shown to have suicide ideation. And I think religious um, connection Funny thing about um, religious connection, when my sister, um, she was a little girl, her favorite, um, her favorite uh, Bible uh, or scripture was ele Hebrew 11.1. 1. It was putting faith into someone, something unseen because she thought that Santa was gonna come and bring her gifts and just have faith every single day. And we're like, that doesn't happen, it only happens on Christmas. But um, point is, is that she was a, she went to church, she, she loved God, she put her hand there, but it was family. We didn't serve her. We did not see the signs, we did not know the signs. Mental health care, like I said, it's really like getting some vitamin D if you need to go out in the sun. Um, it's getting therapy, talking, 
um, being involved, it's helpful. Um, these are all ingredients to preventing suicide. I'm sure you, everybody has some kind of um, self-care tips um, you can share with each other. Uh, my little sister was um, going to a vegan ice cream shop, a raw vegan ice cream shop. I don't know how that is. I don't know what raw vegan is, but I'm supportive of her. But yeah, she likes to go to the raw vegan ice cream shop when she's, you know, when she wants to care for herself. Okay, next page. You have to be proactive. Um, you have to be proactive because you are the only one who's your own best advocate. No one can advocate for you because you can see a lot of therapists, you can see a lot of professional help, and they can also prescribe you medication and different types of therapy, but you are the only one who knows what works for you. So if it doesn't work, you have to say it. And then find, it, it will take a couple of times sometimes. From what my sister, we have never even knew she had a therapist. Um, next. And now, this didn't happen years ago, many moons ago. Now the law requires insurance to cover mental health services, the same as physical health services. Now, what's great is they're pumping in about, as of 2023, July, they pumped out about, I think, 104 million, 404 million, um, uh, dollars towards mental health. So this is a great thing. They have telehealth now, teledocs, and so there's going to be a lot more resources for someone who really needs it for mental health. Next. Exercise, sleep, healthy diet, stress management. We all go through stress. We all go through these things. It's just a level of what you're able to contain. Next. Um, support for loss, that's really big. Um, those who have gone through losses or lived experience like Benji and Ms. K, they do need the help, and so do we. So um, that is always like a good prevention um, method as well. The, and the most important thing is to put time and space between the time that they have the thought and uh, the ideation. Limiting excess no guns, if they have guns, because 50, more than 50% of uh, death by suicide are by uh, firearms. Other ones are by uh, poisoning, which that is, pre that's, poisoning has come um, per the CDC that uh, it's gr it grew 70% from the ages of 10 to 12. Poisoning, so um, it gives, gives you an idea of like where um, limiting means goes. Um, excess, um, of course, bridges shouldn't, should have barriers. And so those are the things we can do. Okay. And what you can do is start just having a conversation. It's a simple conversation and the warning signs. Sometimes we, we overlook the warning signs, but they're there. There's, there's talking, next slide, the way they talk. I want to, I, they talk about death. They talk about finality. They talk about like, I want, I want to go. And sometimes they joke about it, but you always want to make sure it, you take it seriously because they shouldn't be talking like that if it's out of character, right? Their behavior, they start to be aloof. They start to um, be more depressed. They start to isolate themselves. That's a big one, isolation. Now, when someone is going through a lot, a huge life event. Sometimes it is, you know, good to like reach out. And if after two weeks they have not snapped out of it, that's when you want to, you know, take it more seriously. Okay, that's when you want to raise the question of do they need professional help and care? Um, behavior, acting selfishly or recklessly. Um, they sleep or sleep too much. Um, Benji giving away stuff looking what like clever ways to kill themselves. Um, again, it's um, putting the car in the garage, um, withdrawing from activities, the things they used to love, they don't love anymore. Next one, the mood, you can tell. Moods are like vibes. When you go into a room, you can tell like how you, the feeling that they exude, you can tell. It starts with, sometimes they're aggravated with whatever you're asking, depression, anxiety, or they're impulsive, 
Next one. And this is a big one for me because we could all trust our gut. It doesn't hurt to trust our gut because when we are always when we fear how we're going to look at the other person and at least we can trust our guts like, there's something going on because in retrospect when i think about it i i felt like there was something going on with my little sister the day before but i just it's my little sister she doesn't need me right but i should have and i didn't next one and this is a great way to start when we talk to them in private, we want to take them to the side where no one you know, would know. And then we want to listen with empathy and not judgmental, non-judgmental listening. We don't want to fix their problems. We want to avoid um, doing anything that would trigger them. We want to minimize their feel. We don't want to minimize their feelings because what they're feeling is their feelings. And we don't want to say, well, you, don't, you shouldn't feel that way. Or my father says, we don't have those problems. So this is a huge thing. If possible, if you are the person that is there with them, stay with them. Because of course you wanna, I don't think you wanna, you know, unless you're in, like, in the middle of danger and they're in the middle of the act, that's when you call 911, but you want to stay with them. You want to help them like, um, remove, remove themselves from the dangerous uh, by lethal means, and then help them get connected with a professional. Next. And then that is the support. However, two years ago, we got that 988 number. It's just three digits. You can even text it. There are um, licensed um, counselors on the phone. Um, also, great news next for emergencies, 911. They're probably not going to like it, but of course, you know, that's when, like, it's some, they're in the act of. The good thing about 911 is that the mental health first aider training are being extended to all law enforcement. So before they start arresting people, they now know how to de-escalate. They, they learn how to, they are now also mental health first aiders as well. So that's a great thing. Firemen, nurses, first, aid, first responders are now having this training. This is the first training because now we realize that mental health and suicide is kind of a big deal. Next one. Um, so ultimately all we wanna do is create a culture where we're smart about mental health and that we're more comfortable talking about the realities of our mental health and what that means and, um, and what we can do to, to help others, to save lives. Because that's how I got started. In my past life, um, I was a VP for a FinTech company. Up, um, it was international. I did not know anything about mental health. Um, it doesn't happen in our family. When I lost my sister, August of 2020, there was a denial. It was like, wait, we thought, you know, like someone broke into our apartment, all these things. And then when we found out that it was self-inflicted, we don't have those problems. And so we're like, okay, maybe it's a fluke. And then I wanted to research it. And that's why I got, and that's how I got involved because I prayed. I prayed so hard to God every single night. And I said, please give me direction. I need grace. Please give me grace. And one night, I'm thinking, oh, Orange County. Orange County, American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. Volunteer. You'll get to learn everything about suicide prevention. And then I made it a mission. And I pivot to healthcare. And I became a, non, um, a volunteer as a community health worker for the homeless who are, uh, who are struggling with mental health. And uh, my biggest thing is I don't want this 
com a simple conversation to slide, if we can save lives. And I don't ever want anyone to ever lose a sibling, a loved one, because we didn't take that action, because we were too scared to ask. And now we, I hope that from this uh, presentation, you found some um, resources and something to take away. Thank you. I think on the next slide, maybe, or no? There it is. All right. So just pick one of those questions, uh, discuss it around your table, and we'll pull you in a little bit. Okay? Go for it. All right. Whoa, that was a lot louder than I thought. If you weren't awake before, you're awake now. All right. So we're going to do our panel discussion now and uh, try to get at some of the some of the questions there. Do you want to start, Kay? I'll let you start. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, I wasn't expecting it. Oh. <laughs> is, it, um, is it possible to overreact if someone says they're thinking about taking their lives? And um, is it possible to overreact? Sorry. There, it is not possible to overreact. There, it's, it's always safer to be on the safe side. So let's say you're overreacting, right? The conversation is being made. So never be afraid um, to talk about it. Or Because if there is an overreaction, let's say you're talking to your child and it is a blatant overreaction, but you are making the attempt to talk about it. And so if the child or the loved one has been thinking about it, they see that you're someone that can be trusted, someone that you can talk to, and someone that actually cares. Because that's the biggest part is caring. And by reacting or overreacting, you're caring. Just as, as a mom, um, I, I just was thinking, the, actually, I think the danger is more the other way underreacting like oh you're such a drama queen oh you know you're such oh you think you've got problems you wait till you're my age and then you'll see where problems are I'm like particularly like to teenagers so I think that sometimes we can go the other direction by being dismissive and minimizing when someone especially a child is telling you of their pain or their struggle it's really probably more I don't know if it's more likely but I would just say avoid underreacting as much as falling apart and like, oh, you can't do this. You know, I mean, you can do either. The, the empathetic, kind, listening, wow, that must be really hard. I am with you in this. You are not alone. We, we will get the help that you need. That is a much better approach than, oh, my gosh, you don't know what problems are, you know, which I actually have had parents tell me. And I just, I want to, I want to, Grab them and just say, please don't do that to your kid. Please don't do that to your husband. Please don't do that to your wife. Please don't do that to your mom. Your dad. That's not the way. Sorry, I really feel strongly about this. Go ahead, Todd. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so what do, you, what do you do when someone has, let's say, a diagnosis, and maybe they're struggling with suicidal ideation, but they don't want to do anything about it? Like, they don't want to take the next steps. They don't want to do anything. That is actually very common. It, it's more common, um, it's about 40% of individuals who do have those ideations who will not take the steps. What we can do is to encourage them, listen non-judgmentally, listen to their story, offer encouragement, engagement, give, give some resources, and um, show them that you're there to talk and help them through it because we can't we have to respect their space and if they're not ready to do so at least you can reaffirm that you are there you are encouraging and you're being empathetic Tay um, kind of piggybacking off of that one of the questions was um, somebody was saying I'm a, I'm a little confused because uh, one of the slides said don't give advice um, but then I also thought, you know, that it would be good to let them know that they have reasons to live. So how, how do you, how do you find, how do you walk that fine line between, yeah, you get it. Oh, yes. So there's a step in crisis, through crisis mode. So there's prevention, intervention, and then crisis mode. 
So when the person is in crisis mode, they're not thinking clearly. They're not going to want to hear anything about why they should live. They want you to just listen and just be there. That's all you can do. Just listen judge non-judgmentally. You assess the situation. You have to assess, okay, is this person close to where they can hurt themselves? You know, you, you make sure you take those steps to protect yourself and the person. What we're talking about, like don't um, offer advice is during that time because they're already in crisis mode where you want to, where you can give advice or you can tell them what they want to, what they have like to live for is the preventative part when they are showing some signs or like the, the slower signs of, you know, mental challenges, not so much where they're on the ledge already. So there's um, a fine line on that, but it's really, you want to talk, have that conversation before the crisis happens. That's why. Yeah, that's great. And that is, it, it is, it's a hard, it's a hard thing to maintain in that moment, right? Cause we want to do everything at the, at that moment, like fix everything, get them back, get everything good. They tell us they're good. We know they're good. We feel great about it. But in that moment, the, the listening is, is super important because otherwise it becomes more about me getting what I want out of it than them. And uh, boy, I tell you, anybody been there? I've been there for a bunch of different times and it's difficult. It's really hard to maintain that. So that's excellent. Um, another question is for, um, you know, for a family member who has someone in their family who's struggling, let's say with suicidal ideation and thoughts, uh, how do you take care of yourself while also taking care of them? That is a great question. And, um, you know, it's something I personally, I'll be vulnerable, I struggle with. I take in about five to 10 calls a day with someone um, that's in despair. And if I don't take care of myself, um, if I don't have my self-care, I go right down that rabbit hole with them. Um, so it's important that you stay close to God. Um, you, you're, for me, and this is, you know, advice, you know, this is what works for me, is I'm always connected. If I'm always connected with my higher power, which identifies Jesus, then I'm filled and I can share that love. If I'm empty, then, then I, start to, I start to go down. So it's eating healthy, it's, uh, having a spa day, taking care of yourself, putting your gas, ma your air mask on, uh, exercise, walks, just taking a break, being quiet, listening to music. But there are all kinds of self-care. In fact, we have a self-care uh, piece of paper on our booth over there with a lot of strategies as well. Can I just answer, just as a someone who, you know, lived with, for 20 years with, um someone with serious suicidal ideation. Um, and the number of times that I stayed awake, you know, in, I called it my, um, my worry chair, because uh, it just felt like nights were always the hardest. I don't know if that's true, but nights were just always the hardest for Matthew. And I'm, I might be sleeping peacefully, and yet there would be, I'd get a text at 2 a.m., and it was like full-blown crisis, and happened over and over and over, and then I would be up, and then I would go to my my worry chair and, you know, journal and read verses and cry and sing songs and all this stuff. And um, one of the things that I, I totally agree, my own practicing my own self-care was really necessary. But one of the things that I had to learn to do on a very deep level was to be able to come to the place in which I could say, my hope is not an, an outcome. My hope is in Jesus. I can have hopes for my son, but my hope is in Jesus. Because at some point, there has to be a realization that you as a family member, you as a friend, cannot be with another person 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. That's impossible. And so you can't control everything. And letting go of that control at, at a very deep level is wrenching. It's, it's wrenching, but it's also freeing because it gave me the ability to say, I will do everything I can, and I did. And at the same time, I knew that there were things I could not do that were beyond my power, beyond my ability. 
and that, that I was going to survive no matter what. Um, because of Jesus, because of my faith, because of my walk, because I knew he would be with me, because I knew that life would not be over, although we would grieve desperately if something happened. That's a really scary thing as family members or loved ones to come to those places of release, and yet they are exactly some of the deepest spiritual work we have to do in taking care of ourselves. We do what we can, and then we know that the outcome is not in our hands but we will do everything we know to do, but we will also release them into God's care. Benji, um, as somebody who, you know, really has walked this road so, so personally, after you um, had, you know, you came, you woke up in the emergency room, what were, were there any things that family members and friends did that helped you from that point on? I could tell a couple of things that made me uncomfortable first. Uh, what made me uncomfortable was recognizing that people were uh, being careful around me, you know, walking on eggshells, making me feel that I was different or, you know, for what I had done. Uh, that was hard, you know, showing up to someone's house and you could tell the conversation had been made that I was coming and just, you know, people just being careful around me. You know, to, to when someone at their attempt, they they desperately want to feel normal again. And then they, you could feel it when people are cautious around you. So that that was hard. You know, that was what they would do wrong is they I could tell I could feel that they were cautious around me. The good things they they done, which they probably had done all along, I just wasn't my eyes weren't open to it, is they were just there for me. And they, you know, one of, one of my, you know, good friends from college, she really walked me through and was there with me when I had to go to treatment because I did have to go to treatment. I had to find out. I just had a, an attempt. I had to go find out what, hap what led me to that. And she... Uh, she took care, she helped me, you know, with that process of finding a treatment center and just navigating it with me because I was, you know, for the first time I was trying to count on people because for someone in my state, you always hid and you always try to do everything on your own. So for me to allow someone to help, it was, it was, it, it was free and, and, you know, a lot of friends came out and they helped just without judgment, they helped me, you know, get through it. They visited me when I was at the treatment center and they just looked at me and then they just talked and they listened. And uh, that was the right things to do was just to, they, I was, I felt heard, um, I felt loved and uh, I didn't feel judged. Yeah. That is good. Uh, question, how, so one of the questions that was asked, how would you approach a, a family member about concerns you have for another family member? Like maybe it's a, you know, it's your daughter's, you know, daughter, like your granddaughter or something like that. How would you approach them about it, especially if they might be defensive about it, you know, or maybe, you know, like Kay was saying, don't really see it. I think it's really important. Um, and family dynamics are one of the hardest and most complex relationships we would have. The last thing we want is to step on anybody's toes because they begin to alienate us. That's normal human behavior. What I really wished, though, that my mother did um, was, to, was to have an open mind and address the issues that we were telling, that maybe my sister was telling her about and be, to be receptive to that of what she needed from her as a mother, it was, we didn't know much about, um, we thought the relationship with my, uh, my sister and mom was fine um, until her journal um, was found um, after her death. And there was tumultuous just mental challenges that she had that she had adjusted with mom that mom just said, stop thinking about it. Or why do you have to think about it that way? You think you have it bad? 
And so that, that broke down the barrier of communication. So in this case, because it's a grandchild, I think um, listening, I think um, slowly addressing the problem, not so much head on, but showing maybe um, some more education, some more resources, just to link those two together. Because as a parent, you'll never see our child as being anything, and then our grandparents see something like wrong with us. Like, oh yeah, you know, my mom noticed that my niece um, had missed a um, one leg was shorter than the other when she was three months old, and the mom didn't even know. So there are things that grandma can see because of life experiences naturally than mom would. So I think addressing it, um, not head on, but having resources and having an honest conversation about where they're at um, would have to be because ultimately it, that conversation will need to happen before it spirals into something that's non-controllable. I would, uh, yeah, cue off of that and uh, Benji and just say, so what are some specific steps uh, that a friend, family member could take if someone express, expresses the desire to take their lives or you just get the clue that things are not going well. What are some specific things that you would do to help somebody in that situation? So if that, was a, if that happened to me, um, first and foremost, okay, so now be prepared as a loved one. You're in it, right? You're, you're in it and you're gonna be with this person because this person expressed something very serious to you. And so now this person trusted you with that information. So now, you know, you, get, you need to be with this person, you know? You need, can't leave this person alone. Um, so that's number one. Be ready, now, now this person counted on you to be there, so you're, you're gonna be there for this person. So there are a lot of things you could do. If this person reached out for help, first and foremost, um, you have resources. One of the resources is 988. Now, you call 988, it's not gonna be a dispatcher on the phone. This could be a licensed crisis counselor, and they're gonna, they can help you talk you through it. I've used 988 many times many times for loved ones and random uh, patients. They would call them and then they could take it over and they are professionals and they could talk your friend or loved one through it. And if they can't and they feel this person is a danger to themselves or to the others, that's when emergency personnel will be, um, will be sent. But first, if, if someone's asking for help, that's the first thing, because it's easy to remember, 988, and you could text it, 988, because that, that reach out, that, that trust that they're coming out for you for help, you, that's, you know, take that as a blessing, and now, you know, take some action. Great, um, and also in Orange County, we have, uh, the, some mobile units that are Be Well. Christy, if you have questions, uh, Christy, just raise your hand. Christy works at Be Well. And um, there's at the Be Well campus in Orange, there are also mobile units that don't involve law enforcement automatically. If you call 988 or 911, um, not 988, but 911, you're going to get um, law enforcement will be involved. And you just need to know that because that. Um, it can be frightening, it can be traumatizing, it's also necessary sometimes. But if you're not sure and the situation might not require that, you could, uh, the mobile unit, um, and you can talk to Christy, and there are six or, six or seven cities in Orange County that have a mobile crisis unit that will come and stay and talk for a long time and um, they are able to bring law enforcement if, if someone is, um, is needed in that moment. But so many of the times, just having that mobile unit personnel come and sit and talk with the loved one can de-escalate or, if necessary, help them get to a facility. But that doesn't involve the, the trauma of, of bringing you know, law enforcement into a situation. And then there's also the crisis um, assistance team. So if you call and you need um, an assessment that uses law enforcement as well as trained mental health per personnel. They can come. So that you, there are options. Um, you want to add to that? Oh, your hand. 
I also forgot two uh, two one one is OC links, and um, because it's going to be hard to remember, you know, oh, uh, be well. Two le uh, two one one they have be well's info, so they're trained to know. Oh, you know, this is happening. Where do you live? Uh, be well can help. Kay, does uh, Saddleback have any any resources for someone like if you know my brother? You know, came to me. You know, is there someone I could call at Saddleback if I don't want to take it there just yet? Yeah, um, absolutely. We have uh, we have minister of the day, so we have ministers that are on call. Okay, so we have someone who's monitoring the, our phone here, twenty four seven, or or on, well, I mean, in the middle of the night, we're not sitting by the phones. But anyways, we monitor the calls that are coming in, and uh, our pastors and staff are trained on all of that. So to be able to direct people to what their next steps are, to talk them, to talk to them about what's going on, and to also kind of assess and take the the proper action as well. So absolutely, we 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 connect with those all those numbers you talked about too. Because we, we're I was talking specifically in crisis, but what if we're not in crisis? Does Saddleback have resources? Oh, yeah. to, you know to start the. The process of you know like therapy or counseling oh yeah absolutely well we also have our church counseling that we have we've got um on top of that we have support groups so we have our various support groups for those living with mental uh mental health issues and family members of so yeah we've got a whole bunch of different things to Again, walk a family through that christy <laughs> if you are a family member and you would like to be part of a support group yep. with family members christy and her husband lead that dj 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 um leads one of our uh online just online just online uh, for people living with mental illness and um, also support groups. So there's people right there that you can talk to, uh, you know. Yep, and we have those groups online and live. So there's the option too. So if someone's a little concerned about not coming in, but they'll go online, we've got them online for them too. So Absolutely. it's great. Two books I wanted to mention. Yep. That uh, one of them is called Loving Someone uh, with Suicidal Thoughts. It, fabulous book. I wish that it had been around uh, when Matthew was alive because it is just super practical. It's super helpful. Loving Someone with Suicidal Thoughts by Dr. Stacy Friedenthal. And um, if you just get the Loving Someone with Suicidal Thoughts, you'll get, you'll get the book. But it's, it's not, you don't have to be like a scientist to be able to understand it. It's just written for average people. Really, really good information. So that would be if you have someone in your life who struggles with suicidal thoughts, if you are someone who struggles with suicidal thoughts. There's another great book called, um, in fact, we had her speak here before. It's, um, I love Jesus, but I want to die. It's a very stark title, but I'm telling you, it's a really great book. Um, so if you have suicidal thoughts or suicidal ideation, that is a super great book. And if you love someone, then the other um, thing. And then somebody asked a question. I don't, maybe Todd, you ended up with it. But it was, you know, I am, I don't necessarily call myself a Christian. I'm open to all sorts of faith. Is there you know, anyhow, you are welcome here. You can ask us anything. We will be glad to walk with you through the life journey that, that you are on. You do not have to call yourself a Christian to receive the help and the love and the counsel and the care and the support that, that might be helpful for you. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And even our church counseling, we don't, you don't have to be a member to get church counseling here. So if people come from the outside, that's great. We, we want to help. So that's what we're here for. So now, um, if you're in an intimate setting and someone comes to you, like a friend, family member that says, hey, I'm in a tough time and I'm feeling, you know, like I just don't want to be here anymore, like everything's too much. A great question would be, how long have you been thinking this way? Because we know that suicide just doesn't come out of nowhere. It was leading to it. So when you get that answer, it'll get them talking. And then you can also ask, okay, can you tell me what's going on? Like, what causes this thought now? And so it helps them to open up. So when you open with very um, neutral, open-ended questions, it helps them to kind of dig inside and have a conversation. So that's for intimate. Um, if they're not, if they don't, they, if they do not want to call anybody else, they just want to tell you, like a best friend or something. Um, so those are good um, openers. How long have you been thinking this way? Because you want to you want to assess: is this a crisis mode, or are they just saying it because things are just tough? Because it happens sometimes. So that'll be a good um, assessment. So a lot of open-ended questions, no judgment, and um, I think that helps a lot too because that like really de-escalates a lot of um, those uh, those talks. Great, thank you very much. Well, hasn't this been great? Yeah.
Very, very, very. Thank you guys for being here with us. Very important topic uh, for us to cover for sure. Um, well, a couple things. Uh, first off, we do have uh, giveaways. I got two bags to give away here. So there is a green card under your seat, not green bubble gum, a green card, okay, that will look just like this. Let's see who's got Feel those. Feel free to look under your neighbor's chair, too. And you can look under your neighbor's chair it. if as you long have as no not neighbor. sitting in it. <laughs> All right, there's one right Woo there. Woohoo! Come on up. Yeah. And one more. Hey, there we go. Oh, yay. That's for you. Okay, Perfect. so th that, is, that is a great book. It's, it's called um, Common Courage, and it's Prayers and Poems. Uh, f and with some photography, it's a beautiful little gift book there for prayers and poems and photography um, for common times. And so I hope you enjoy those. Oh, that's great. Uh, a couple things too, just so you know, on the slides there, we do have our mental health support groups as we talked about. So we call them family grace for family members and living grace for those living with. Okay. And so uh, again, talk to DJ or uh, just talk to these guys about it afterwards. Um, the other thing is, is if you look up here, we have how to get involved in mental health. We have the mental health community. We've got our counselor training. These are all ministries that you could be a part of. If you're interested in that, uh, just leave a little card on the table for us and, uh, and we can uh, get you involved in that. And on that, we have the Breathe Retreat. You want to say anything about that, Kate? Two weeks from this weekend. Some of you have been or you're going to come. Yeah, for moms, uh, if you have a child of any age live, who struggles with their mental health, so there's still time to sign up. You can come up and talk to me or Luan, Luan um, our program director for Breathe, about that retreat coming up. There we go. And for next month, uh, our next mental health community is on October 22nd. We have Dr. Uh, Anna McCarthy. And uh, she's uh, going to come and talk to us about how to talk to your kids about uh, drugs and that sort of thing, right? Because we have the fentanyl crisis and things that are going on here. And so she's going to come and talk about that. Uh, anything you want to add to that? That's Yeah, not just students, but particularly give parents some language, some verbiage um, to, to use, but also just about... It is a crisis. It is that she was telling me it's the number one cause of death in Orange County right now between 18 and 40 is yeah. um, is an overdose. So yep. no family is immune and come and learn. And uh, yep. I think she's got a British accent. So it'll be so fun. <laughs> it should be very nice. Yeah. Yes, well, there it's you a go. great accent. Excellent. All right. So that's for next month. So uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we will see you next month. Have a great one, you guys.